And welcome into the latest edition of the New England Hockey Journal's Rinkwise podcast. I'm your host, Evan Marinovsky, alongside Patrick Donnelly. Pat, how you doing? We're good. You know, baseball season's nearing its end here, and then we'll off season will roll on with some showcases and tournaments coming up. Yeah, and the best part is hockey's getting going. We've got uh, the Fox Pro Prep League coming up. We've got uh, district uh, select camps, which is going to be great. Uh, and Pat, a, a disturbing trend is continuing today. Uh, another hockey parent has has broken into our podcast and has forced his way on. Another hockey parent is here, uh, but it's a pretty big hockey parent, uh, and that's Jay Pandolfo. Uh, Jay played uh, at Burlington High School from 1989 to 1992, went straight to BU for four very successful years, drafted in the second round, uh, 32nd overall by the Devils uh, in 1993, 13 season for the Devils, two Stanley Cups, uh, actually was a scout for the Devils uh, in 2010 to 2011, I think, while you were playing, which I want to get into, which is very interesting. Um, and coach with the Bruins for seven seasons, became an assistant at BU in 2021, and is now the head coach of the men's team. Jay, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Of course. Of course. Um, is this an off season for you right now? Or no, there's no real off season. Uh, I would say there's never really an off season. Um, there is definitely a little bit of downtime after graduation guys left or you know three weeks into may so it's definitely quiet but we always have guys still training here and uh you kind of always got to be around there's always something going on whether you have recruits in or or you're going out recruiting a little bit um you know this job is it's 12 months a year now and, um, you gotta you got you got if you get if you're gonna do it you gotta be in it and you gotta be uh willing to to put the work in but it's definitely a little quieter now yeah, you can't take the summer off, unfortunately. That's a real shame. Um, for you, I, I want to get into your career path because it's so interesting. You know, things have changed so much um, over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, you went from Burlington High School directly to BU, which you really don't see much anymore. Um, you guys had Mick Frechette this past year go from Dexter to you guys. Uh, but again, that's a prep school. Do you think your path would have been different now? Oh, definitely. I think the the landscape has changed so much now. Um, it, even in Massachusetts, it's just a lot different. I think back when I was growing up, everyone, you know, played at either their public high school or, you know, they went to the Catholic conference or went to prep school. And um, that was the path then to, to go to division one. And um, I played in the Middlesex league and there, there were, uh, I can't re exactly remember the number that had to be, 10 guys in that league that played division one and went right in right from there. Um, so just the landscapes changed. Uh, you don't see it anymore. I, I don't remember when the last kid out of a public high school stepped right into college and played right away. So it, it's just changed so much. Um, and it's not just in Massachusetts, it's throughout uh, the U S uh, the path. It seems like most guys now too, you're not going in as a true freshman anymore unless you play at the national development program or you're uh, from Canada, or, you know, we obviously had Tom Willander this year from Sweden um, who came in as an 18 year old, but just college hockey's gotten a lot older too. So that, that's part of it. And you had Macklin Celebrini 17. So that was uh, another thing. <laughs> very young too. Yeah, um, do you think that's for the worse or do you think that's a, a good improvement that hockey has adapted to? Um. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Uh, I think college hockey's gotten really old. Um, so it just, the path to get there takes a lot longer than it used to. I don't know if they should be able to, if they should cap the number on, on when you can start or when you can finish, uh, with, that would definitely change things. Um, I don't have a great answer for you on that. I, I would like to see guys have the opportunity to come in younger and maybe guys that are older that there's a number where you know if you hit this age by whatever it may be September then you know you're not eligible anymore uh, that would make it younger I think that would keep it competitive I think you'd get a lot of development when you get kids coming in at 18 19 maybe rather than 2021 20, but as freshmen but th that that's the landscape right now I need more so oh, oh go Pat you go no, I was I was wondering if you do you think that'll sort of maybe I don't know if it's the right phrase, but, you know, level out a little bit where, you know, we're leaving the era of COVID years and guys being maybe five or six years deep, depending on red shirts, COVID and all that. 
I think I think it'll help a little for sure because I think a lot of guys have gotten pushed out or pushed back because of that extra COVID year because you know the college team is going to take advantage of, of of taking a guy that has a fifth year that has a lot of experience um, that can help your team. You know they're going to help your team right away from the body of work they already have uh, mm-hmm. playing four years of college hockey. So that that makes a di- big difference. So it, it'll be interesting to see even the portal. Uh, next summer where you don't have the extra year uh, for a lot of these guys. I do think it'll make a difference. I do think it'll help a little bit where guys won't get pushed out and, you know, maybe you'll start seeing more guys again, start coming in at, at, at 19 years old instead of 20, 21 years old as freshmen. On the path up though, like, you know, you going from Burlington straight to BU now, obviously kids are, you know, might do a freshman year at Burlington, but then go to a prep school. And then if they're really good, they go to juniors before they go to college. The way that the path has gone and you have the academies too, do you think that's, do you think the amount of options is good or is it, you know, you're seeing this with your son, Sam right now. um, Or do you think that it's, there's almost too many options? What's sort of your take on that? I feel like there may be too many options. Um, I think there's, there, you know, it's, it's a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm getting to that point now where, yeah, my son is, uh, going to be a freshman in prep school uh i don't even know exactly what the right path is and this is this is my job now to try to you know re- recruit kids out, out of certain spots and there's so many different spots now to recruit kids where that makes it a little bit more difficult too i think for for some of the college coaches um so yeah i i, I don't know um I do think there's too many options in, in in my opinion, but I don't think that's going away. I think there's going to be even more and more options now. So um, I think it's a, it's a train that you're not really going to get back on the track when it comes to that. No, I don't, I don't think you are. I think this is just going to continue to expand and expand and there'll be more academies. And, um, and I, again, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's bad. I think it, you know, there's, there's options, but I think there's definitely um, a lot. Uh, you mentioned the recruiting element. Um Kids at that age, uh, you know, that sophomore year age, recruiting becomes such a huge thing. Um, I'm curious, you know, you've been doing this for a while. You've uh, recruited a lot of, of, of high-end talent. What are some mistakes that parents and families make during the recruiting process that you've noticed that maybe continually come up? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I can't really think of, like, mistakes. I just think every every kid um is different and every path isn't the same so i think maybe parents um chase certain things because they they see uh one of their um you know kids friends doing something and then they feel like they need to do it and i'm not sure that's necessarily the right thing i think every kid's path's different i think um you know, if they're if they feel their kid is in a good spot, is getting good coaching, is getting a lot of playing time, they should maybe stay there because sometimes there's value in that uh, rather than trying to make the next move. I think that's the biggest thing is everyone's always trying to make the next move um, and, and that can become an issue rather than, you know, just staying where they are if things are, are going well. Do you feel that pressure at all as a parent? Um, Not yet. You know, but at, at some point I might. Um, but right now, um, you know, for me, I'm fortunate where where my son's at. Uh, I know he's getting good coaching. He's getting a good opportunity. So I'm real happy with that. So for, for me, I'm lucky in that regard. I, I mean, uh, Freddie Myers coached my son since he was, I think, maybe second year mites uh, with the Junior Eagles. And now he's coaching him in prep school. So I've been fortunate to have that. I know he's getting good coaching. Uh, so that that's important. That's an important piece too. Do you remember playing Freddie at all in the NHL? Freddie Meyer was actually on last week. So oh, no. <laughs> do you do you remember playing him at all in the NHL? Any like oh, yeah. stories of oh, that? Absolutely. Um, well, he he played with my brother at BU, so so I knew Freddie uh, pretty well. And I th- I think um, when you play in the, in, the, in the National Hockey League, in any time there's another BU guy that plays on another team. Uh, I mean, you recognize that pretty quickly. So there's always like a little bit of banter on the ice and different stuff like that. Um, but I remember Freddie, yeah, he was, I remember him being a Philly and then with uh, the Islanders and Atlanta. So yeah, it, it's always fun to play against uh, former BU players, even if you, they weren't your teammate at the time, there's always that connection. Um, so, so that's pretty special. 
Pat, you got something? Um, I was sort of thinking just when going back to recruiting a little bit um, and sort of the way everything's changing and, you know, NIL is a huge factor in basketball and football. How, how much has that, you know, become a factor, whether it's, you know, transfers, recruiting on the hockey side? Uh, I think it's going to become more of a factor than it has up to this point. I think it is a, a small factor right now, but I don't, th- I don't know if anyone really knows where this whole thing's going with, yeah. with the NCAA. And, um, but I do feel like it's going to be more of a factor than it has been over the last couple of years. Uh, I think it's going to continue to grow with, with, in, in hockey. Um, it, it's never going to be basketball or in football just because of the money they generate. Hockey's not going to get to that point. Um, but but I do think it's going to come into into play a little bit more uh, with players uh, making the decision um, based on some of that stuff. Um, but up to this point, I don't think it's um, made a huge difference. But like I said, I do think at some point it's going to. What's interesting is with NIL money, I remember one of the big critiques with hockey was like, oh, you know, the the big the powerhouses like BU's and Michigan's and BC's and those schools, you know, they're going to have so much money. They're going to go all for the all for the top talent. But and I could be wrong about this, but I my view of it was more so you guys always are in the mix for top talent. It's always you take the money out of it. You guys always are in it for those top kids. It's all it, it a lot of time does come down to. BU versus Michigan versus, you know, BC. Do you think money is going to change it drastically if it, if it becomes a, if it continues to become sort of a, um, uh, have a big impact? Uh, I hope not. I, I, I hope um, guys are, or recruits are still making decision based off the best fit uh, where they think they're going to get the best development. Um, all, all those factors I hope is are still really important to, to the recruits um, and not just chasing the money. Um, you know, I, I think the high end guys uh, are obviously going to be offered certain things from certain schools. Um, but I think at the end of the day for them, they're, they're eventually going to get the money um, when they sign their pro contracts and, um, hopefully they're really looking to see where they're going to get the best development with the best path for them to have success at the next level. So hopefully that's still going to be important to, to the recruits. You mentioned fit and that seems to be something that comes up a lot, you know, kids finding the right fit um, kids commit young and then the fit isn't right. I mean, we saw the Cole Iserman with you guys, you know, Minnesota and then, and, and then goes to BU. What advice would you give kids how do you find out what the right fit is? And can a 15 or 16 year old, do they know what the right fit is for them down the road? Um, I think it's just, you know, th- these kids, uh, the high end guys are, are going to have um, some great options and great opportunities. And I do think that, you know, after doing their visits, uh, meeting the staff, kind of everything that goes into it. I think they can get a pretty good feel for where they think they fit in after meeting some of the players out of there. And a lot of these guys know some of the players that are already there. They've probably played with them at some point or know someone that has. So I think all those factors uh, matter it, that, you know, do you, do you, um, depending on where you live, uh, is that important to you? Do you want to play in front of your, your family and friends? All, all these factors go into it for sure. Um, being from Boston area, there, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot, obviously a lot of great options. Do you want to play in the bean pot? Did you grow up watching that? All, all these things make a difference. So I think that, you know, has something to do with the fit. And then also, um, are you a type of kid that wants to go somewhere where there's really good players and you have to compete to, to earn a spot and earn your ice time? Um, I think that's really important for, for guys. Uh, I think they should want that, they, you know, want to play with the best players, practice with the best players every day. So all those things go into it. Um, do they 100% know at 15 and 16? You know, I'm not exactly sure, but I think they can get a pretty good feel, um, especially the, the high-end guys, because at that point when you're 16, I, I think for the most part, we have a pretty good feel or how they're going to end up. That makes sense. Um, and when you were getting recruited out of Burlington High School, um, were there other school? What other schools were involved? Was it always BU? Like, what was sort of your take? What, what, what was what was that like? 
Yeah, no, it wasn't always BU. Um, so my older sister went to BC. Uh, my dad uh, went to BC. So. Oh, man. BC wow. Was, I did not yeah. know this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You don't see that yeah. often anymore. Yeah. So uh, and then UNH, uh, I, I Dick Millie lived in Burlington. I knew his family really well. I really liked I had a lot of respect for him, really liked him. Uh, so it came down to those three schools. But again, for me, it was just fit. Uh, I felt most comfortable at BU, um, especially after my visit. Uh, Mike Boyle is a big factor in that. Um, you know, at that point, BU was developing a lot of players that were playing in the National Hockey League. I think Mike Boyle had a big part in that uh, with the strength and conditioning program BU had. Uh, Jack Parker. It's just a. It's just. It was just a feel for me. Um, I wanted to play in the bean pot, so it was tough for UNH that way. They don't they don't play in the bean pot. Uh, and at the time, too, I just, you know, I, I really enjoyed my visit at BC. I, I love the guys over there, but I just felt more comfortable um, going to Boston University. So that that, that was um, that that was my decision was based off a lot of those things. Pat, that's got to be music to your ears. Just oh, it's awesome. Especially, <laughs> it's be great for you. I mean, as you know, too, I'm a huge bean pot guy. So yeah. Um, to have that, you know, little feather in the cap. Do you want to skate fast? For 50 years, Laura Stam instructors have taught youth players to pros how to skate correctly, powerfully, and fast. Players who attend Laura Stam power skating programs learn how to skate fast by learning how to execute every maneuver in hockey. They become powerful, stable, efficient, and explosively fast skaters. If you can't wait for a clinic, join our subscription skills video service and we'll show you the skills taught at our clinics in an easy-to-use video format with training plans to guide your training. Register or subscribe now at laurastam.com. That's L-A-U-R-A-S-T-A-M-M dot com. You can learn to skate fast. Hi, I'm Rachel Hedden, head girls lacrosse coach at the Frederick Gunn School, an independent high school in Connecticut. We play in one of the most competitive prep school leagues and place athletes at top college programs. To learn more, visit gogun.org. That's G-O-G-U-N-N.org. Become a Raven at Portsmouth Abbey School, a premier Benedictine boarding and day school for grades 9 through 12 located on Rhode Island's classic coast. Join an independent, co-educational community that embraces your uniqueness and welcomes you as no other school can. The Abbey prepares you for your future by nurturing your talents, cultivating your curiosity, and helping you grow in knowledge and grace. With over 40 athletic programs and 25 student-run clubs and organizations, you will build friendships that will last a lifetime and discover passions you didn't know you had. Portsmouth Abbey School, something greater starts here. Visit us online at portsmouthabbey.org or call 401-643-2000. When you were at BU, did you ever think, like when you were a student and you were playing, did you ever think, hey, one day I might want to be the head coach here? Or did that not enter till much later? Yeah, no, that didn't enter at all. That, that, was, <laughs> that was much later. I wasn't thinking about coaching when, you know, uh, I was playing at BU. Like for me, I was thinking – I mean, I, I enjoyed my time here. It was incredible. Um, but I was, you know, obviously I, I wanted to play in the National Hockey League. So that was my focus, not on not not coaching in, in, in any way. But I do think being here, um, I think I learned a lot from Coach Parker. Even if you don't realize you're learning a lot, you are learning a lot um, just from being around him. And I was around him for four years. So uh, I think that certainly has helped me. Uh, get to where I'm at now that I am coaching and coaching at BU. So, uh, but no, I didn't think about it at all at, at that time. That's wow. You, you weren't plotting like four steps ahead, you, you know, <laughs> no. as, a, and as a 19 or 20 year old kid. And it's interesting because you were a set, you know, you were 32nd overall pick um, in 1993. Uh, you stayed your four years at BU. Then you went to the NHL, had a really successful career. Um, do you think kids are too in a rush to leave college now? I think at times, no question. Yeah, I, I do. And I think part of it, the thing that doesn't help is, um, and I understand it from the NHL team's perspective, you know, they they're, they don't want to lose guys either. So 
after their third year, if they go back for their fourth year, there's potential that guys can walk and, and be free agents. So I think sometimes even teams will, will take the guy out a little earlier than maybe uh, they want to just because they don't want to lose their, um, their rights. I, I think that's part of it. So, and then the player, you know, you know, you're getting an offer an NHL contract. It's not easy to turn down. Um, you, you know, I, I think for us, like we try to have honest conversations with, with all our players when it comes to that point on where we think they're at. Um, and hopefully they, they, take our advice. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And, and we understand that, uh, that part of it, but I do think a lot of players are a little bit too much in a rush to try to get to the next level. Um, cause the, you know, the college path, it, it's a great development path to get to the national hockey league. And you see more and more guys going that route. You see guys coming from overseas. Now you see, you know, obviously a lot of Canadians are, are coming down and, and taking this path instead of major junior. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think I've seen a guy stay too long, uh, put it that way. Yeah. I'm sure it, you're kind of going through that now with Macklin and the whirlwind it's been since the end of the season. Yeah. So Macklin, like for me, I, I don't think he can make the wrong decision. Uh, and I, and I think I've said this publicly, I do think he is ready and capable to play at the not national hockey league level. Um, but in saying that he still is. He's not, I think he's turned 18 this week. Um, so he'll still, if he came back, he would still play his whole freshman year as an 18 year old and probably still play his first NHL game as an 18 year old. Cause I'm sure he would go at, at the end of the, at, at the end of the season. Um, so I don't think it would hurt him to come back, but I also can't sit there and look him in the eye and tell him that I don't think he could play at the national hockey league level. Uh, Cause I know he can. So uh, it's just a decision. He has to make the decision what's be best for his career path. And, you know, I I'll um, I'll support him um, either way. Um, we have a great relationship. We talk about these things. So and I obviously know the GM pretty well in uh, San Jose. And and I know they would like him to, to take the next step if if they do end up drafting him, which I'm, I'm sure they're going to. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I think they, you know, they would like to see him um, play for San Jose next year. And I guess we'll have to wait a couple more weeks to see how this all plays out. Both Macklin and his father publicly have said some interesting things. Uh, and I feel like they have a lot of perspective. You know, obviously his dad is a trainer and, and works with the Golden State Warriors. Um, sometimes, you know, you hear parents, you know, they're you know, high expectations. They seem like they're very realistic about this whole thing. I imagine they've been pretty pleasant to deal with throughout uh, kind of this whole whirlwind draft thing. Oh yeah. Very, very easy to, to, to deal with. Um, Macklin's dad, Rick, he, he's worked in pro sports for a long time. Uh, he has a very good understanding. Um, he works for the Golden State Warriors, which is a great organization. And he understands um, that NBA national hockey league, uh, they're really not development leagues. Like you, you, like you have to go in there and be ready. And I, I think, you know, they're weighing all these things. Like they, I think uh, Macklin and Rick, his dad, I think they know he's capable of playing at that level, but is the time right now? I think that's all the things they're trying to weigh. What's it look like next year in San Jose? Um, all these things they have to factor in. So I think it's great that Macklin has his dad that he can lean on for, for some of these things. Um, and I think it's going to help him make the right decision. And like I said, I, I, I don't believe he can make a wrong decision. You know, if he comes back, I think there's a lot of benefits. If he leaves, I think, Hey, he's ready to, to take that next challenge in um, and go from there. Yeah. I mean, dominant year this yeah. past year, obviously Hobie Baker and, and, and all that, um, you know, these past couple of years as, as head coach for you, um, been very successful um, for you personally, like what's one thing in running a division one college hockey program. Um, that's a bigger thing than maybe you initially thought is there, have there been surprises for you? Like what, what have the past couple of years been like as head coach? Uh, I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I, I've been fortunate. I have a great group of uh, players. Um, they've bought into kind of trying to do it, how we want to play, how we want to act, all these, all these little things that go into it. So that that's been great. I've got a great staff that that's really helped me. 
Uh, I think Joe Pereira, who's been around college hockey for 10 years, or maybe more now, 12 years, he really understands all the things that go into it. So he's really helped me a lot. He's taken a lot of stuff off my plate. He's probably done some things that I don't even know um, <laughs> that, that I need to do. So he's helped me in so many different ways. There's just a lot of different things. Forget the forget the hockey, you know, forget the practice, the game planning, all that sort of stuff. There's just a lot of other things that go into it. Um, you know, when you're even when you're recruiting a player, all the things, you know, getting the transcripts, all, all these little things um, that he's on top of that I'm still learning. Um, so he's helped me that way. And then even bringing Kim Granvold in, um, you know, from the Bruins, uh, he's helped a ton with uh, the development piece and making sure all our guys are um, on the right path. And he does a heck of a job with that. So I'm really fortunate with that. Uh, it's just all the other things that have nothing to do with hockey is, um, is, is new to me and still learning in that, in, in that regard. And, and all these changes that are, you know, going on with the NCAA. Um, you know, I, I didn't expect that. So it's interesting, interesting time to, you know, be coming into college athletics. Uh, I'm only, you know, two years in as a head coach here going on in my third year. And it seems like this changes weekly uh, with what's going on. Rules, rule changes, NIL stuff, portal stuff, um, all these different things. So, so those are the things that for me are, are different. Pat, do you have any other BU questions? Cause then I want to, dive into his career NHL career a little bit um more or less just I guess when you know obviously when you were with the Bruins when did sort of getting into the college ranks and coming back to BU sort of you know enter into your mind was it like kind of something quick like just like jumping at an opportunity or something that kind of you were thinking about for a little bit uh I would say it first started um th I was thinking about it a little bit well, David Quinn, when he was here, uh, when he was the head coach here, he had talked to me a little bit about if I'd have any interest in coming back and being like an associate coach with him. And I was kind of just getting started with the Bruins, I think, at that point. So the timing wasn't right there. Um, so that was probably the first time I thought about, you know, at some point, getting involved with BU. And then when Quinny left and, and went to New York, um, that was the the next time that, you know, I had some conversations with Drew Marichello, who's the AD. Um, but at that point, still, I was with the Bruins and um, the timing just wasn't right at, at that point. And then after working with the Bruins for three years, uh, three or four more years after that, um, my, I have young kids uh, now. Well, Sam's now almost 15, but I have an 11 year old daughter, nine year old son coaching at the NHL level. Um, you miss a lot. You're not around a lot, um, you know, especially over the school year, especially when, you know, sports are going on, all these things. I just felt like I was a miss, missing a lot. Really enjoyed coaching in Boston. Like I didn't really want to leave. Um, you know, obviously great organization. We're having a lot of success. Uh, but then I had the opportunity, um, Albie had, had called me and, you know, was wondering if I'd come back as associate coach. And at that point, I just thought it might be a good time um, to get out of the pro game for a little bit, just to be around my family a little bit more. Um, I, I know it's still a grind coaching at the college level, but it's just a different schedule, um, especially hockey East, like you're you're home, you know, you're in your bed every night. Obviously, you have a couple of trips a year where you might be away. Obviously, they're recruiting a little bit, but you can control your schedule to, to some to some point. Um, and I just thought being around my family a little bit more and then just the opportunity to come back to BU, a place that was, you know, for the best years of my life, um, just the history of the program, how much I cared about the program. And, you know, I, I figured I'd, I'd give it a shot. And that, that's kind of how it happened. Um, and now, you know, obviously I ended up taking over as head coach uh, the following year. And, you know, I'm, you know, really proud to be the head coach here and grateful to, for this opportunity. And it's been it's been a lot of fun up to this point And we want to keep it going. Do you think that one year uh, as an associate before becoming the head coach, you think that helped kind of, was sort of a nice runway to being the head coach? Like you think it would have been a much different fit if you just came in with the head coach immediately? 
No question. I think it helped a lot just to kind of understanding the college landscape a little bit. Cause yeah, if I came in from um, the Bruins, you know, coming in as a head coach first year and not really knowing much about how everything works in college, it definitely would have been more of a learning curve. So I think that getting that year under my belt certainly helped me. No, no question about it. Um, it made a big difference and kind of getting to know how everything worked at BU getting to know some of the players when I was the associate coach, because we had a lot back uh, my first year as a head coach. There's no doubt that that helped the transition. It's funny, you know, uh, every year when there are NHL head coaching vacancies, there's always a slew of college coaches who are rumored, oh, David Carl or Greg Carville or Nate Lehman or, uh, and you're kind of moving into one of those names and, and you see, you know, Dan Hurley over in basketball with, with UConn getting that Lakers offer and turning it down to stay in college. Um, one thing college coaches have said, you know, I've heard say in the past is just, you know, the stability of the college life, as you mentioned, sort of being around your family more. Um, is that something for you where you've, you know, you value that? I mean, do you think it's smarter? Obviously, every college coach is different, but do you think, um, you know, college coaches uh, are prioritizing those college head coaching jobs over the NHL head coaching jobs, given the instability at the NHL level? I think so. I, I think, you know, especially if you look at the last couple of years, uh, the stability at the NHL level is not is not very good with all the coaching changes you've seen. Um, so, yeah, there's something to that. There's no, no question about it. Um, you know, I think if you're going to make the jump from college to the National Hockey League level, I think you have to be pretty sure that you're going to a stable situation. You're going to get a uh, good opportunity. Um, you're with a good organization. You're going to have a good team. Um, but for me right now, um, like that's that's not even in my in my mind. I, I think I've, you know, just I feel like I'm just getting my feet wet here. Um, I love being here. Like, like I said, um, th this is the spot for me for 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 a long time, hopefully. It's interesting to hear you sort of put it like that, because it's it's goes hand in hand with what we were just talking about with the players is just the interesting dichotomy of that. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's um, yeah. I'm, I'm real happy here. So uh, it's different for a player. They can only be here four <laughs> years. Hopefully I can, I can last longer than that. So um, yeah, it's, but it's, this is a great place to, to I think to grow as a coach too, because you're, you're coaching some, some high quality players. Um, so it's, it's really enjoyable. It's funny. A lot of most college kids would probably want college to last more than four years. They want to be be you forever as a college hockey player, I would imagine. Um, same with most college kids in general. For over 20 years, Eric Nate's Euro Hockey has been helping hockey players of all ages develop their individual skills and improve on all aspects of their game. Through structured drills and innovative training equipment, Eric Nate's Euro Hockey's intense on-ice instruction challenges each student to be the best at their ability. Find a hockey clinic or summer camp that is right for you today at nateshockey.com. That's N-A-T-E-S hockey.com. Eric Nates Euro Hockey, trained to be the best. Are you serious about playing your sport in college? Do you need a flexible education that allows you to maintain your practice and competition schedules while also preparing you to succeed at the next level? You should check out the University of Nebraska High School. UNHS is accredited and offers more than 100 online courses, including NCAA-approved courses to protect your academic eligibility. Students could earn a UNHS diploma or take a single course for transfer credit. Courses are college prep, self-paced, and available 24-7, 365. Enroll anytime and take up to a year to complete a course. Visit highschool.nebraska.edu today. Your own career, you lasted a really long time in New Jersey. Um, what was that like? You won two Stanley Cups. Um, why do you think New Jersey was such a good fit? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, you don't really pick where you get drafted. So I was fortunate. Um, great organization. Um, really, everything, um, everything revolved around winning, um, having a team first mindset um, we obviously had some great players there but everyone put the team first uh, I think we all know Lou Lamorello who's still a general manager in the National Hockey League with the Islanders I think he's he's got to be 81 82 years old yeah it doesn't seem like it's slowing down uh, but he um, 
he, he knew how to run an organization, um, making sure that he got the right type of people, right type of players that, you know, would put the team first. And um, it went a long way for our organization. We had a lot of success. Um, they won a Stanley Cup before I got there, and then I was very fortunate to to win two while I was there. We lost one in the finals as well in Game Seven versus Colorado. Um, that that one I'll, I'll, I wish I could get back. Uh, but Ray Bork won that year, so you know I grew up loving Ray, so I was happy for him, but not happy for myself in that one. But um, it's just a great organization, um, and I kind of it was a good fit for me. Um, you know, it, coming out of college. Did I think my career would maybe go a little bit different? Obviously, I was a little bit more of a scorer in college, but I found out pretty quickly that, you know, everyone can't play in the first and second line and play in the power play in the National Hockey League. There's pretty good players out there. So I had to find a role, and I think I did that when, when I got to New Jersey. And, you know, it certainly helped me have, have a long career. But just the, the overall fit with the organization was, was a great fit for me. This uh, This might sound super generic, but – what go, what goes into winning a Stanley Cup? You know, you, a lot of guys never get there. A lot of guys never, you know, win one. You won it twice, obviously on real, you know, great teams. What was it about those runs? Why did those team, you know, why did those New Jersey Devils teams, you know, contend every single season and and win two eventually? Yeah, I think I think the the you definitely need to have a little bit of luck. There's no, there's no question. You you have to get some bounces over the course of the, of those um, playoff series and playoff runs. Uh, I think you gotta have you have to get buy-in from from everyone on your roster. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, you have to play a certain way. You have to be able to defend. Um, eh, that's part of it. Um, we obviously had great goaltending. Um, with with Marty Brodeur, he's you know going down as probably one of the best goaltenders to ever play. So that, that certainly helped. But we just had a certain identity we played with as a team, and everyone bought into it. Um, you know, our whether you're on the first line, fourth line, whether you weren't playing, and when you did come in the lineup, you knew what was expected. Uh, and we had different coaches. Um, we had uh, Larry Robinson took over and. 2000 Pat Burns was the coach in, in 03 a little bit different coaching styles but still similar identity to our team and to our players and how we played and I, I think that's that that's what you need um, to, to win the Stanley Cup um, you, you need that buy-in and you have to play a certain way and you have to stick to that and you have to believe in it and I, and I think that's what our teams did you know we had a certain belief in how we ha had to play uh, we had great leadership. I think that's a big part of it. Um, we had Scott Stevens, who he didn't have to say much. You just kind of looked at, looked at him, and you, know, you knew what you were going to get from him every night, and you better fall in line. And I think that's part of it. The leadership part is huge, I think, uh, to winning a Stanley Cup. You you have to have that uh, to win, and, and we had that. And um, I think that was a big reason why we had that success. Nothing was better than uh, before a youth hockey game watching like Scott Stevens hitting highlights, being like, yeah, right. I'm going to go into my squirt game and do that exact same thing. You know, those hits were crazy. I mean, my God. Um, but, uh, you know, you mentioned the difference in coaching styles during your career. And, and uh, you know, nowadays you hear a lot about it at the NHL level and at the college level as well. Different coaching styles, having to approach players differently than maybe you did when you were coming up. Do you notice that a lot? Like you, you, you know, you can't coach the exact same way that someone coached you in the in the nineties and then in the two thousands. Oh, no, yeah, no question, no question. I think, yeah, I think the you know the biggest difference now is um, the communication. Uh, I think that's that's the biggest difference. I mean, there were coaches I had. Uh, I'm not going to mention any names or anything, but uh, at the national, they they wouldn't even they would, may, might not even say hi to you if they see you in the hallway. It's just it was just a different mindset back then. Um, you didn't really know um, where you stood, like if you weren't playing or weren't playing a lot or you didn't get a lot of feedback. So I, I think the biggest difference now is there's just so much more feedback the players want. And I think it's much better, too. I think there's a little bit more give and take than there was um, as a coach, too. You want to hear from the players, too, like coaches aren't always right. Um, so I think that's that's the biggest difference now too is it's not like coaches have they're only ones that have the answers I think the players a lot of them have good feedback too so I just think that constant communication with your players with your team 
uh, it goes a long way. And, and I think that's one of the biggest differences from when I was coming up. They're just the communication is, was completely different. And I'm not saying I didn't have some coaches that did a good job communicating, but overall, that, that's the big difference for me now is just kind of having those relationships with the players and um, them understanding that they can come talk to you anytime you want. And they might not always like the feedback they hear, but, you know, the door is always open. And that, that, that's the biggest difference. Does that come as a byproduct of those coaches, you know, uh, treating you and other players like that? Or does that come from having to adapt? Like, you know, did that come from your own experience or was that something that uh, was sort of a generational change in general? Or was it both? I think it's both. I think a little bit of both for sure. I think it's a generational change. And I think also, you know, I had some coaches that were very good communicating and, uh, you know, I, I always enjoyed that. And I think most players do, whether, whether you like what they're telling you or not, it's still, at least, you know, it's like, you know, if you have honest conversations with your coaches, um, like I said, you might not always like the feedback you're getting, but at least, you know, what they're thinking. So it just gives you a better understanding of, of what's going on and just how it, it can only help you. And you, kind of figure out what you need to do better instead of kind of thinking, I, I, don't, I think I'm playing pretty good. I have no idea what's going on. The coach doesn't tell me like the, it just, that, that, that helps so much when the coach gives you feedback and, and you know where you stand. Pat, do you have anything else before uh, we wrap up? Yeah. Just kind of going along these lines. Um, you know, when you're kind of looking back on your own experience, whether as a player or now as a coach, um, whether it's coaches along the way who sort of impacted you and, you know, whether you had in New Jersey and then obviously Jack Parker um, needs no introduction who sort of, you know, shaped your, your kind of vision, I guess now. I think it's a, I had a lot of coaches in New Jersey. Um, I think I had played there 13 years. I bet I had nine or 10, uh, which is crazy. But so I think you learn a lot from different styles. I think you learn a lot what not to do as well from certain guys or what you don't think works. So I think you can learn that way. Um, the biggest influences I'd say probably Jet coach Parker, just cause he coached at this level. I, I really liked the way he, um, he, he, he held you accountable. He can be hard on you, but the communication was there and that's, that's back a long time ago. So I really appreciated that. Um, Larry Robinson, who I had, he, he was excellent, uh, with the communication. Um, he was no question a player's coach. So he had a big influence. Uh, Jacques Lemaire was probably the smartest coach I, I ever played for. He just really was a great teacher. Um, the communication, I wouldn't say is, was as great as his teaching was, um, like one-on-one. -on -one, I mean, like he obviously was a great teacher, with, uh, te like with the team and, but the one-on-one -on -one stuff, maybe not as much. Um, Pat Burns was, he just, he wanted you to compete and play hard. And I had a lot of respect for him. I really enjoyed playing for him. We won a Stanley Cup with him. Uh, Bruce Cassidy was one for me. I obviously didn't play for him, um, but coach with him. I learned a lot from him. Um, I really enjoyed uh, working with him. Like it, growing up in the New Jersey Devil days, it was a lot, you know, we, we were a defense team first. Um, and then when I started working with um, Bruce Cassidy, he he didn't sacrifice defense at all, but he um, he came more from the offensive side of things. So I think that helped me in, in my coaching where it's not just about defense. You have to be able to score. Like, how can you, you know, transition off a of defense? All these little things that I learned from from Bruce really helped me in, in my in my coaching path. Uh, I think I learned a lot from him. In that regard, I learned a lot from him, from his practices. He, he practiced with a lot of pace. Uh, if you, you know, you hear that, you know, pace, like you hear that play fast, all these things, mm -hmm. but if you don't practice fast and, and that's what I learned from, from, from Bruce, like you have to practice the way you want to play. So I, I took a lot of those things. So I learned a lot from him and Joe Sacco, who's a um, BU guy coaching with him, being an assistant with him in Boston, spent a lot of time with him. He, he was an excellent mentor for me. I learned a lot from him and I still do up to this day. I have a lot of conversations with him about hockey on a regular basis. So he's helped me a ton. Were you surprised that uh, Bruce Cassidy's tenure ended in Boston when it did? Um, 
maybe a little bit, but I just think it's the nature of the coaching business in the National Hockey League now. Um, obviously had a ton of success there. Uh, they felt like it was time for a change, and, and that's kind of the nature of the beast to, in the National Hockey League. And obviously he went on to have a, some pretty good success the following year, uh, winning a Stanley Cup. But also, too, you know, the Bruins brought in a great coach, and Jim Montgomery said two of the, the best uh, regular seasons in uh, Boston Bruins history the last two years, and he's done a heck of a job there. Um, so um, now they got a great coach uh, with, with Jim being in there. But, um, yeah, it's, it's the nature of the, the business. And if they never hired Jim Montgomery, um, who would feed Sam those pucks from the back end? The JP Montgomery. I mean, that you know, on the Junior Eagles, that that's – I think that's the benefit no one's talking about uh, in this whole thing. Um, <laughs> speaking of parents, I want to end on a fun question. I asked this to Freddie Meyer last week, um, and he gave a pretty good response. Um, what does it take to be a good hockey parent? What are the do's? What are the don'ts? Um, you know, what's your take on that whole thing? Oh, man. Um, I think you have to let the kids – find their path rather than parents trying to find the kid's path and let, let them enjoy the game. Uh, I think that's, that, that's the biggest thing for me is, is let them have fun with it. Um, Cause at some point the pressure is going to build. I, I don't think kids need to be having pressure put on them when they're mites, squirts, peewees. There's always going to be that, that pressure, let them enjoy the game. Um, I, I think that's my biggest message for that. Um, it's supposed to be fun. And I see too many because I'm a I have a younger son, a younger daughter that played too that are younger than Sam who are only mites and squirts and um, I just see some of these kids at such a young age um, feeling so much pressure and I think it comes from the parents. So let the kids enjoy it. Yeah, it's always sad when you see kids get yelled at when they're like mites or squirts. It's like yeah, they're kids. Like what are you gonna do? Um, and you see it even at, at Sam's level, at the at the 15s and the 16s level where kids are getting, you know, yelled at by parents. And I think that's another, um, you know, a don't for sure. Um, Pat, do you have anything else before we wrap up? No, I think that's a good spot to end. Perfect. Well, Jay, thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure I'll see you around the rinks this summer uh, at different uh, camps and things like that. And um, Pat, thanks for joining as always. Uh, and that's been this week's episode of Rinkwise. You Rinkwise listeners have a great rest of your week. <laughs>